In this edition of In the Trenches with Dave Lappin, presented by First Star Logistics, special guest, assistant head coach, special teams coordinator, Darren Simmons. He's going into his 20th consecutive season with the Cincinnati Bengals, the most respected special teams coach probably in all of football. It's, he's done an unbelievable job. He's molded pro bowlers out of special teamers, some long careers. Kevin Huber has been here forever. Darren Simmons has a lot to do with that. We're going to talk to him about his football background, what makes him click as a coach. You're really going to like what Darren Simmons has to say about the game of football. You know, over the years, I've seen a lot of uh, big athletes in the National Football League with the Cincinnati Bengals, and a lot of guys eat, including myself. I mean, everybody had big appetites. And at training camp, man, you know, you wanted to eat, but it was like you were working so hard, you couldn't really eat as much as you wanted to eat because it was hard to digest. I mean, you have a full practice in the morning, and then how much lunch to eat before you have to go and have another full practice in the afternoon? Then dinner time was when guys really put on a show. That was the, the food frenzy. Breakfast and dinner were the pretty big ones. Breakfast, not quite as much as dinner because you had a full practice after you eat that breakfast. You didn't want to leave breakfast or lunch out on the practice field. That's a bad experience. So you, you, you wanted to make sure that you didn't overeat. But we had one guy, a lot of big eaters, Steve Chomazak, a former uh, player at Syracuse University, a defensive tackle, God rest Steve Chalmers, like, God rest his soul. He was a big, big eater. Chalmers was a big, brute, strong guy. But the greatest eater of all time, Bob Mad Dog Maddox. He was uh, drafted out of Frostburg State by the Cincinnati Bengals, played defensive end. He was also drafted in the ABA. He was a really good athlete. And he was a guy whose metabolism was just unbelievable. I mean, it would just burn, burn, burn all day long at a high, high rate. And he was always trying to gain weight. He always wanted to get a little bit bigger, a little bit thicker in his frame. He had a big frame because, like I said, he got drafted to play some basketball. But he was just trying to pack on some uh, some good muscle. And, man, this guy, I, I got behind him for the first breakfast, and he took a tray, a cafeteria tray, dumped a family-sized box of cornflakes on the tray, and doused the whole thing under the milk, the auto, you know, the, the milk dispenser and ate the whole box of cornflakes off the tray. Then he went back and pancakes, sausage, bacon, you name it, stacks. I mean, stacks upon stacks. I've never seen anybody eat so much for breakfast. And I'm thinking, he's going to go out there and, and, and practice? Man, if, if he fell on the ground one time and hit belly first, that could have been an ugly scene out there on the practice field. But that's that's just an example of what he ate. When at, at, We'd have uh, T-bone steaks. He'd stack seven of them on his plate, like pancakes go through seven T-bone steaks. I mean, if, if, if there was a turkey uh, that four guys were supposed to share at a table, he'd take that turkey and by himself carcass that bad boy. It was like the Tasmanian devil attacked that turkey. He would bury that thing by himself and just unbelievable amounts of dessert. And just, I'm thinking, where does he have a tapeworm? Where is he putting all this food? Bob Mad Dog Maddox, I would have put him in an eating contest anywhere, anytime, against anybody in the National Football League or anybody in the world. I don't care about what's-his-face that eats all the hot dogs, Nathan's hot dogs. I don't care about that dude. Bob Mad Dog Maddox could have eaten probably 70 hot dogs just like that guy if uh, he didn't have to go to practice in the afternoon. He could consume some food. And uh, I remember talking to some of the cafeteria workers about the amounts of food they would order for meals when the entire Bengals team was up there at training camp. It was staggering what the grocery list was on a weekly basis for feeding all of these guys up at training camp, players, coaches, and everybody involved with the organization. A lot of big eaters, a lot of big appetites, a lot of food consumed. Unbelievable. Welcome once again to the studios of First Star Logistics. You're in the trenches with Dave Lapham, and joining us in the trenches today, Bengals Special Teams Coordinator, Assistant Head Coach, 
first and foremost, the great Darren Simmons. Coach, welcome to the show, sir. Well, thanks for having me on. I feel honored to be in the trenches. I have been <laughs> in the trenches before, so uh, this is an honor. Well, I'll tell you, the th thing we're going to try to fill people in on, on what a great athlete uh, you were and are, but let's, let's, let's talk about it. First of all, back in high school, you were a quarterback, right? I mean, you, you, you called the signals. You were, you were the guy, give us a little, a little background as to the athleticism and athletic abilities of one Darren Simmons in probably multiple sports. Well, you gotta, you gotta remember I'm from a small town in Southwest Kansas where there's a, a grand total of about 2,100 people. So um, you know, I was probably the second biggest player on our team. <laughs> and I was a, was a quarterback. I was the middle linebacker. I was the punter. I was the kicker. Um, you know, you had to do a little bit of everything. Um, but yeah, I, I started a quarterback there for three years. I started as a three-year starter in, in uh, all those. I started when I was a freshman as a punter. Um, you know, again, when you come from a real small town like that, the, uh, um, uh, the, the talent pool is what it is. And, uh, but I did that. I played basketball also in high school. Um, we did not have baseball in my high school. We, we got baseball after um, I graduated. Um, so I was in. I was on track. I was actually a thrower in track. I threw the discus, threw the shot, ran the uh, four by one, ran the ran the four hundred. Um, but baseball might have been my best sport. Honestly, I played I played baseball in the summer, um, but it just never really had an opportunity because it was summer. It was a summer deal. You know, me being a farm kid. Um, it was difficult to uh, uh, really get into the baseball part of it because I had so much to do and help my family on the farm. So had they had baseball in high school, I, I'm, I'm sure I would have probably done that instead of track. But, you know, everybody there is a three sport athlete and, uh, you know, because they, they got to rely on everybody. So in baseball, you were a pitcher? I was a pitcher, a catcher. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I, was a, uh, I was a better catcher than I was a pitcher. You know, sometimes to be a, a good pitcher, you got to throw strikes. And I, I struggled with that sometimes. I had a good arm. Um, that's probably why I was the catcher, but, uh, um, I played a loud field too, and on, on uh, some all-star teams, uh, played center field, but, uh, most of the time I spent catching. So you, you go to Dodge city community college and you're a punter quarterback there and you're a junior college all American. I mean, you're not just a guy, you're, you're a big time guy. Well, I don't know about big time. Again, you got to this, the one thing I will say that's unique, the, the conference that I played in the Jayhawk conference was was a really good conference um, in, in terms of the um, football. Um, Butler County has been a, a fantastic program in that conference for a long time. In fact, uh, Zach Taylor, our head coach, he played at Butler. Yeah. Um, you know, there, uh, there's a lot of kids that, and a lot of players, even on our, on our team that have been through that conference. So it, it was a good conference. Um, I, I started for, I started a couple games as a freshman at quarterback and I started my whole sophomore year at quarterback. I, I started both years as the punter. I was, I mean, let's face it, I was a better punter than I was a quarterback, um, for sure. And, uh, um, but we probably put, uh, made a little hesitation in some teams because I'd play first and second and third down at quarterback and just drop back in the deep shotgun punt. So I'm sure you probably fooled some people. And I got some yardage I probably didn't deserve by kicking over somebody's head. First team All American, though, coach, that, that dog will hunt right there. Then you go to Kansas and uh, you punt there in your, your all conference as a, as a punter. Plus, you're an academic All-American, so a true student athlete. I mean, you you paid attention to uh, the student part of it as well, obviously. Well, because I knew how, with my limited athletic prowess, I better make sure I, I uh, do a good job with graduation and I do a good job academically to uh, enhance myself that way. So uh, at least I had that part figured out. So like you said, though, you, you punted at all levels. You were a kicker at, in high school. As you're working with these specialists now, how big an advantage is it? Because not all special teams that are coaching in the National Football League actually punted the football, kicked the football. The fact that you have been there, done that, how much does that help you, do you think? Well, I mean, it's, it, I think it really helps me. It gives me a leg up on a lot of these guys. I'm sure it's probably some of the guys I coach wish I didn't have the same knowledge that I, I do in it because they would just do their own thing. Um, but, I, no, I, I do feel like having played that position, especially a punter, I, I was just a uh, – a kicker in high school and, and we didn't have soccer. We didn't have anything like that where I'm from. Uh, uh, so I was a straight on kicker. I, I even had the square toed shoe. I did. I was not a soccer style guy. So the, the whole soccer style, you know, kicking the way it is now. Um, I, I've just learned uh, over the course of time 
you know how to do that and the traits that you need for that. So, but I'm, I'm much more polished in the punting area. Um, but I do believe it gives me an advantage when I'm evaluating and also certainly coaching these guys because at least I, I have some background, some knowledge of, of what it takes to play that position. And when you were at Kansas, the Jayhawks had pretty good success. You, you guys were a top 10 team. Uh, you went to the Aloha Bowl and you beat UCLA. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that, you, you guys were a damn good football team. Yeah, my, se my senior year, we finished 10-2. Um, we lost to uh, Nebraska. We lost to Kansas State. If yeah. there's one – if there's one uh, uh, game my whole athletic career I wish I could have back or wish I could flip it on to be the Kansas State game my senior year because that's obviously a natural rival for us. Yep. Um, and we didn't play well in that game and lost. And then uh, we ended up losing to Nebraska uh, again, too. So, I mean, I think they were national champs that year. So we, we played them. We, we played those teams tough. Um, but we had a good team. Um, we, we, we played really well uh, in the Loja Bowl. We played UCLA. UCLA had some great players. They had Jonathan Ogden and – um, you know, J.J. Stokes and Donnie Edwards, and they had a lot of great NFL players on that team. Um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the running back, not the basketball player, the running back. Right. Um, Cade McNown, I think, was the quarterback. So, you know, we, we had a lot of good, uh, um, uh, you know, a lot of good players on our team, too. So it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed my uh, college experience. When did you know that you may have had – would, in your near future, have a – deep interest in coaching? Well, it was really probably, you know, I, I was fortunate, uh, you know, growing up, my uncle was a strength coach in the NFL. He was a strength coach for the Browns. And so I would go and uh, every year and help out as really as a ball boy, essentially a training camp with the, uh, it started off with the New England when he was with the Patriots. Um, and, and then eventually it led to his, his time with the Browns and ultimately the Ravens. And uh, I spent a lot of time, again, not only helping him in the weight room, but at practice, I would go and be with the special teams coach and, and help the specialists, whether it was shagging balls or listening and learning. And, uh, you know, luckily for me, it was with, with one of the premier special teams coaches in the NFL, really in NFL history, and his name by the name of Scott O'Brien. Right. And uh, he taught me, um, you know, the, the huge part, all my background in the kicking game, you know, comes from him, whether it was, again, learning how to coach specialists in addition to my knowledge, but learning how to coach those guys and handle those guys and then to all different phases. So I, I got to be around him a lot in the summer times over the course of uh, several, several years. It was something that uh, I watched and just learned from him. Um, you know, quite honestly, then after my playing days were over, uh, uh, my senior year, it kind of expired. I had a chance. To, I had a couple workouts, NFL workouts, nothing really panned out. So I stayed on uh, that next year at Kansas as a graduate assistant because um, it was it was kind of twofold. A, it was so I could keep preparing or, or keep that door open potentially if an opportunity came as a punter. But also it got my foot in the door a little bit. And, and so I could dabble in the coaching part of it, too, albeit as a graduate assistant. So um you know, and then some opportunities came up for me and I had to make a decision, you know, which way to go to keep chasing the dream as a punter or, you know, chase this other part of being a coach. And I, I thought I better, you know, again, because of my limited prowess, athletic prowess, I figured I probably better go to the coaching uh, aspect of it. And I did. And I, I don't second guess that decision one bit. Um, you know, I went to I went to where I had the best chance to succeed. So that's how I got into coaching. Would you have gotten into farming if you didn't uh, get into coaching, do you think? Would it would family business as such? Yeah, for sure. You know, it, it's something I still, uh, you know, in, enjoy. I enjoy it immensely. Um, I go home every summer um, at the end of mandatory mini camp, and I help my dad with weed harvest on the farm. Right. Um, he, he farmed about, uh, oh, 42, 4,300 acres. Wow. Um, it, it, he doesn't he doesn't uh, farm quite that much anymore. Um, he's kind of backed out of farming a little bit as he's gotten older. But, um, you know, I, I still very much enjoy going back to the farm and, and helping him do all the things that uh, I did as a kid, you know, albeit in a limited period of time. It's only the course of a couple of weeks. Uh, but but uh, I completely immerse myself in that. I'm glad it's for a couple of weeks. I'm ready to come back when it's time to come back and, and get going back in football again. But I, I'm sure the farming, because it's what I knew, it's what I grew up doing. Right. And uh, um, it was something I was familiar with. So I'm sure had this football thing or coaching not worked out, that's probably what I'd be doing. So will you be uh, sitting sitting atop a big uh, farm equipment, some sort of combine. a you know, yeah. combine? Combine. Oh, there you go. Combine. Combine. Yeah, it's what, what harvest wheat. 
yeah so yeah i actually i actually have my own combine my dad has a combine i have my own combine too um to help him with harvest we've been you know like i said i've been doing that every single year that uh um well since i was probably 15 or 16 years old you know i've been drive drive the combine in the summertime and, and help him um but every year i've been in the nfl certainly I, I go back and help him on the farm that's that's our vacation you know fortunately my wife is, is from out in that portion of the country too southwest kansas she's from dodge city her family was a, a farming family too so we all go back and, and uh, uh, you know enjoy our family time. So with the Baltimore Ravens, Carolina Panthers, you know you you would you progressed along like you said, Coach O'Brien, a big factor in uh, in your successes. Uh, and then you come to the Cincinnati Bengals as a special teams coach. What led you to the Cincinnati Bengals? How did that all come about? Well, certainly my my time in Baltimore was the the biggest you know reason for that. Being around Coach Lewis, uh, Marvin was a defensive coordinator there. Um, yep. when uh, Scott was a special teams coach. So I went to training camp there for a couple of years. And then, and then my first NFL job, I was the uh, assistant special teams, assistant strength and conditioning um, under my uncle, under Scott O'Brien. I was assistant of those two guys, but Marvin was the defensive coordinator. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure Marvin uh, trusted the opinion of Scott whenever Marvin had the opportunity to get this job. Um, uh, you know, we'd been in Carolina for several years. I, of course, I'd always stayed in contact with uh, Marvin. Uh, but I'm sure Marvin went right to Scott and asked Scott, hey, do you think Darren's ready for this? And thankfully, I got Scott's blessing. I'm sure I, I guess he obviously told him that, yeah, I was. And, and uh, um, so he brought me in here. And, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity that he gave me, the trust as a young guy that, that uh, he had in me uh, to do this job. So I, I'm forever grateful for him uh, to him for that. Coming up on your 20th year with the Cincinnati Bengals, 20 years with the same franchise, in the National Football League, that's that's pretty rare now. Um, what are, what are your what are your thoughts about that? Well, I'm just very fortunate, you know that uh, um, you know this is a this has been this place has been very good. The Brown family and this organization has been, you know, very 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 good to me and my family. Um, you know they 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 put a lot of trust. Uh, and I think it's been a good working relationship. You know over that period of time, I've, I've seen obviously a lot come and go. Um, and, and to be able, probably most importantly, or in anything, is I've had the ability to uh, you know raise our family here right? and my, our kids. A lot of time in this profession, as you know, there's a lot of moving around that comes comes and goes with that, and sometimes that's very difficult on families, especially children. And uh, we're very fortunate to have you know uh, we moved here when my daughter was one. She's now a, a, getting ready to be a sophomore in college. Wow. And so for her to grow up with the same group of friends, you know, her whole life, graduate with those group of friends is, is pretty unique and, and it's pretty special to me. And, and now we're going to probably get the or hopefully get the same opportunity with my son. Uh, you know, he's he's going to be a uh, he's in high school now. He's getting ready to be a junior. So hopefully we can carry him out and and get him through high school, too. But the, we've been very, very fortunate, uh, um, really, most importantly for me to get my for my family to be in one place and, you know, have the same group of friends and. And same group of buddies their entire life. Yeah, I mean your your wife Rhonda is a great uh, a great wife. Understands you know life in the National Football League. What it's what yeah. it's, what it's about. I mean the wives the sacrifices wives make are, are pretty pretty numerous and and people uh, don't don't understand that part of it. And your daughter and your two sons. I mean they're 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 all athletes. So you get pretty good athletes in your family, don't you? Well, they've grown up around it. Their whole they've grown up around it, so they kind of know what the expectation is. I, I think they probably feel some of the pressure sometime of being a coach's kid, and uh, and, and that's okay. I, if the, whatever it takes to push them a little bit to make them, you know, feel the pressure of, of doing those things, you know, that's okay. But I, I want them to do what they want to do, not because they're a coach's kid. If, if they if sports is something that doesn't interest them, you know, it doesn't interest them, and then I'm okay with that. I just want them to be successful. I want them to grow and learn, you know, be a uh, productive members of society and whatever role that may be. It just, it just so happens that, uh, you know, they, they've taken to sports. My daughter plays volleyball in college at uh, Indiana, Pennsylvania at IUP, which is a small division two school yeah. um, up at Pittsburgh. And, and she really enjoys that. And uh, my son plays, both my sons both play football and both play lacrosse. So they're in the middle of uh, um, summer lacrosse season now. And, uh, you know, so we're on that circuit of going and chasing them all over the country, going to these tournaments that they go to. But I wouldn't miss it for the world. I know. I remember those days. Well, my, mine was baseball, summer baseball. Yeah, yeah. traveling yeah. all over the place to to yeah. keep up with uh, summer baseball. From a from a coaching standpoint, um, what's it like when you 
get to work with a guy like Shane Graham who comes to the Bengals and then just develops. You help develop him into, you know, a Pro Bowl kick, first Bengals kicker in history, a franchise history to make the Pro Bowl and and do the things he's done. And now now he's a coach, you know, coaching special teams. What what does that type of thing mean to you as a coach that has mentored and tutored a guy like that? Well, okay, it, it makes me feel like I'm passing long stuff that have been stuff that's been passed down to me. You know, I'm forever grateful for what Scott O'Brien, the, the background that he gave me and the patience I'm sure that he had with me as a young guy, learning, learning how to coach in this league, him being highly successful and, and him being, um, you know, doing all the things that, uh, that that he did to get to that point and to stay at that point. Um, and I, I know that uh, uh, it, it's just a, it's, a, it's a cool thing for me to pass on some of that information that I learned or some of the things that I learned on down to somebody else. You know, whether it be to somebody like Shane and, and you know, I, I, Shane's a smart guy. He, uh, you know, in all of his times playing it, uh, you know, I'm sure he did a good job of learning about situations, just learning the game of football um, more, a lot more than what the, just the fan sees, but learning the ins and outs of not only what it takes to play his position, but what it takes to be the other positions or, you know, from the mindset of a coach. And uh, it's, it's been neat to see him kind of grow as he's transitioned into his role from being a player to now him having an interest in coaching. Um, you know, he'll shoot me texts all the time, ask me different questions about, you know, hey, what do I think about this? And he'll show me, he'll send me copies of his scouting reports. And it's, it's, it's cool to see that, you know, they look a lot like the stuff that we did here. So it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's really neat to see the background kind of get passed down. And, and I think that's part of my job as a coach is to, is to help educate the people, you know, whether it be players or other coaches to help educate those guys to, to this game and, and pass that information along. The one thing that is, Evident, obvious, immediately with Coach Darren Simmons. And I, I, I haven't had the privilege, obviously, of sitting in the classrooms. But on the football field, man, everything is, to a T, organized. I mean, it's like clockwork. Everybody knows exactly what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to do it, when they're supposed to do it. I mean, there, there's no wasted time. There's no wasted steps. There's no wasted effort and energy. Um, where, where did that come from? Is that something that you've developed over the years or – is it something that you observed and said, hey, this is the way I'm going to do it from day one? Well, again, you're creatures of habit, and uh, that's the way it was with Scott. <laughs> and, and so I've really just done it the same way here, honestly. Um, you know, I, I, I know that in, in a, I watch other teams practice, you know, when we're down at the Senior Bowl or wherever we may be. And, and so I, you know, get a chance to see how other teams do it a little bit, and I know how I would want to do it or how things that I would do differently. Um, but, but I think the one thing that you always have to have is you have to be efficient. Um, I mean, you know, that as a player, but your players want things that are, that are tight, they're concise and they, they want that somebody who comes in and, uh, gives them, gives them information, gives them things that helps them, whether it's in the meeting room and then transition that out to the, to the, uh, practice field. But I, I think the biggest thing for you can do as a coach when you're on the field is to have a lot of energy and have great excitement, uh, but be very detailed, um, you know, so everybody knows exactly what to expect. I, I think that uh, with anything as a, as a player, even as a coach, frankly, for that matter, you want to you want to level and you want to try to minimize the anxiety that people have, you know, in their mind. And so the, the more of what you can give them, uh, hey, here's what's coming, more you can foreshadow what's coming down the road, whether it be in practice and, and then ultimately you're trying to train them for things that come up in games. Um, so you try to simulate as much as you can in, in practice what they're going to see in a game, whether it be from the tempo, from the, you know, I'm intense on in what I do, and and, and I, cause I think games are intense. It's not a uh, uh, a lot of walking and talking. And, and so I, I try to make practice situations as close to game situations as I possibly can. Yeah, I think that's one thing that I've heard from so many players that, that uh, you know, love and respect you as a coach is that, oh, man, one thing with Darren, you're never surprised, man. He covers it all, you know, and he's thinking a, a step ahead. And I've never been surprised during the course of the game as things have unfolded, you know. And that that's a that's a tremendous compliment when your players, you know, have that much confidence in what you're about as a coach. That's for sure. Well, it's it's like I said, I think that's part of my job, but but it's also it's important for the, the players too to know and understand that we're I'm just trying to put them in positions to succeed, you know, because that's what everybody wants them to do. They, everybody wants the the player to succeed. It doesn't matter. You know what I know. It's what I can give to them to help them go execute their job on Sundays, and, and that's the single most important thing I've always lived by: is what can I do to make their job on the field easier? 
and you know really for our players to know more about the opponent than they know about us and, and i to just to give any type of advantage we can possibly give our, our, our team and our each individual player the opportunity to succeed and, and ultimately win the game is has been my my uh goal and what i strive to do every every week yeah i remember uh talking to paul brown god rest his soul about coaching and he said you know really what well, we are teachers and you know i, I i'm a teacher and I'm, I'm a communicator I, i'm trying to i'm trying to teach these young men and 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 the bottom line, that's that's what you are. I mean, a coach is, is a teacher, and uh, it, like you said, it doesn't matter if you would grade one hundred percent on the test if your players only going to grade seventy percent. You know, it's yeah. uh, it's it, the uh, when the rubber meets the road, it's what do those guys know and how how can those guys implement it on the, on game day, right? That's what. It's yeah, about. for sure, and it's always unique to me too. I think that. Uh, it was even me as I came up through it. You know, Scott was a difficult guy to, to he was hard to work for. He was hard to work with sometimes. Uh, at the time, I felt that way. But now I have such greater respect for it because, you know, he was preparing me for this step in, 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 in my life, in my transition. And, and I'm sure some of our players feel the same way. I've, you know, I've had a lot of guys reach out to me after their playing days are over. And I think that they respect it more because they understand it more. They've matured and, and they, they understand that, that uh, you know, I, I've got them in mind. It may be, I may have been difficult as hell at the time, but I've got, you know, their success really in the back of my mind. And, uh, and that's really all that matters to me. At First Star Logistics, we're a very strict company that really puts the pressure on our employees. <laughs> Breaks? What are those? That's what I'm talking about, Icky. Get the body right, then the mind's right. You know, yeah. you know you gotta get that body right. That's right. right. Yes, sir. <laughs> Become a star with a chance to earn the highest commission percentages in the industry as a freight broker agent. Check out FirstStarLogistics.com. You've probably uh, coached um, <clears throat> the record setter as individuals or as a team in every special teams department there is that you can statistically cover. Uh, what, what does that mean to you that that you had an impact on? So many individual, so many individuals in their success, and so many teams in their success. Well, just it, it, like I said, good good players make good coaches. You know, in, in uh, I just it, it's cool to just have a small, small, small part in it. I didn't do any of it; they did it all. The players did it all. Um, so it's just cool to have you know just some sort of hand in it or, or be a part of it, and, and just to see the the joy that that. Uh, that the guys get it also the guy the joy that they get is, is what brings me joy too to see somebody like uh you know kevin huber play here as long as he has or to see the success that shane said that shane had or, or that mike nugent had or even randy Bull, all those guys to see them have the success and and just know i was able to be a part of it uh, a very small part of it is is the reason i do what i do you know it, it makes it super fulfilling to me and and uh you know, at the end of the day, you know, as long as they have success, that's the single most important thing to me. Your battery of Clark Harris and Kevin Huber, snapper and holder for your kicking game, has been together a long time. And they're both in pro, they're pro bowlers. I mean, they made it to the highest level. Um, when when you have that type of uh, a comfort feeling, you know, that where my battery of, of my snapper, my holder, that's uh, th those are important ingredients, obviously, with a successful successful kick um how, how comforting is that for you? well it, it makes me sleep well on saturday nights yeah the night before a game no, knowing that uh I, I know what i'm gonna get out of you know those guys um because we've been in a lot of battles together we, we've been through a uh, a lot of wars together too and, and i know how they're going to react just like they know how i'm going to react and there's a lot of comfort uh in, in knowing that and, and i think that's that that's the one thing that you maybe don't want as a coach is any surprises, you know, anything that it's not, uh, you know, we, we have to obviously overcome and adjust, but uh, you know, is if you can keep things simple and you can keep things consistent, you know, I, I think that's a huge thing. And, and I've got a, a great deal of confidence in both those guys and have had for a long time. And, and, and they've backed it up with their performances too. You know uh, in the end, they've, they've, they've been productive guys for us for a long time and consistent performers for a long time. So you've got a, a, a veteran punter in Kevin Huber, and you signed uh, Crispin, Drew Crispin, out of Ohio State. Mm -hmm. potential, potential battle there. Uh, you signed uh, McPherson uh, or uh, as a fifth rounder out of Florida uh, to, to 
compete with Austin Seibert. I mean, you got some competitions going in the kicking aspect, the actual kicking part of the kicking game, don't you? Yeah, you know, I, I think I told, uh, you know, and I never really realized this probably, but I think this is one of the few times we've actually had a punter in here, uh, you know, this at this portion of training camp, you know, at, at, to some to push Kevin a little bit, to push him along. Um, you know, Drew was somebody that uh, I went and worked out at Ohio State. And, you know, I was, I was really up there to see the kicker, Heibel. And, uh, you know, I worked Drew out as also. I had I had a high opinion of Drew before everyone went up there. Um but, you know, I knew we were probably going to be in the market for a, a kicker. So, I mean, it was just great that both of those guys, both draft eligible, both were very productive players in college. And and uh, I was really, really impressed with what I saw that day up there in Columbus uh, watching Drew Pond. I didn't realize that uh, um, he had that type of leg talent. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's almost ironic that, uh, you know, Kevin obviously is, is a hometown guy here. You know, played his high school ball here, played in college here at UC, and, and now he's been our punter for a long time. And then, and we're just fortunate enough to get Drew. Drew went to LaSalle and goes to Ohio State, and, and uh, now he's in competition here. And and and, and again, that, that's all just been by by luck that that's happened. But I do really think that there's something to it. You know, again, even when we had Mike Nugent, you know, who was uh, a Centerville guy and then Ohio State that, uh, you know, th these guys know how to perform in this climate and that they know what the climate of, of playing around here, like not only, uh, you know, from a weather standpoint, but just the, the feel of the fans of being around the stadium and, and what it means to this, what it means to be a part of this team. And uh, um, so, uh, yeah, it, it'll be, it'll be a good competition. We'll see how that shakes out in, in camp. The, the uh, I, I think it'll sort itself out. Um, and just the same way the kicker, the kicking competition is. I'm really excited to see both of these guys perform in, in uh, training camp. Evan is somebody that, uh, uh, again, who performed well in his in his brief high or brief college career. He was a he was a really he's a junior who came out and declared early, so he only kicked three years at Florida. Um, but he was very productive there. Um, he had a great workout for me that day down there in Gainesville. Um, I, 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 in addition to being physically talented, I think he's very talented mentally too. Um, you know, he, he is a, uh, he can kind of let the last kick go. He didn't get too high with the highs or too low with the lows. And, and I think that's what you want out of those type of guys, the steady performers. And I think Austin Seibert's the same way. I mean, he was somebody that had, a, again, that I had a high opinion of a couple of years ago when he came out of Oklahoma. I worked him out in Norman that down at uh, Oklahoma. So um, I, I was very familiar with, with uh, um, him also. And uh, again, I'm excited to see both of those guys, guys kick in training camp. So when you're, when you're, evaluating your special teams players, core players. Um, and, and we talked about it a little bit earlier in the week. You mentioned the 53-man roster is one thing, but the 46-man roster is another. Um, mm -hmm. how, how many – is there a, a number of core players that you have in mind that over the years you said, you know, you need to have at least this number of guys that at least have been here multiple years that understand – what I'm trying to get across and can translate it out in the football field, or is that not a factor? Well, I, I think that factors into it, but I think that has to align with things organizationally too, you know, and, and how you put your team together as an organization um, to keep the best 53 players uh, uh, for your team that way. How does it fit offensively? How does it fit defensively? And then how do they also contribute on special teams? Um, uh, again, to have a that, – that number fluctuates, you know, really from a – a year to year basis. But really when you look at it and we transitioned a little bit, especially defensively from being a four, three team, you know, with, with coach Lewis to being more of a, you know, I, I guess if you want to call it more of a three, four front team. Right. Um, with, with Lou, um, if you want to call it that, but offensively it hadn't changed. Usually on offense, you're usually looking at one running back potentially two. We've had times we've had two running backs have been big contributors. You know, we were really fortunate to, uh, several years ago to have Cedric Pierman and Rex Burkhead, both that were, were outstanding performers at running right. back. That's, that's atypical. Usually you have one from that spot. Um, uh, again, depending on how many guys are active on game day, usually you have, if you can get a couple receivers um, to, to be contributors, one of which usually is your returner. Um, but if you can have another um, core wide receiver, a four core. And I say four core, I mean, punt, punt return, kickoff and kickoff return. Those are the, the big four, you know, mm -hmm. field goal, field goal blocker would be five and six. But if you can get a wide receiver who can be a, a key contributor in, in at least three of those four phases, um, who's a non-returner, that's pretty good. So, um, 
you know, and again, tight ends, we've been very fortunate too here to have tight ends. I mean, you know, quite honestly, our, one of our best cover players over the last couple of years was Seathan Carter, who was a tight end. Right. And quite honestly, you, you don't usually get big con contributions from the tight end position on special teams, certainly in coverage, you know, because they don't that, that's not really how they're wired. They're wired to play offense. They're wired to run away from people and, and instead of chasing people down, you know, like linebackers do. So historically, the mo majority of your 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 most production comes on on defense. Um, so if you can get at least one tight end, potentially two to be contributors, that that's a that, that's a good thing. Then when you go to linebacker, you know, I think when we were a, when we were a four three team, we usually keep keep six linebackers on the forty six man roster. So if you can get three linebackers to be contributors, that's usually the way it, it works. Um, sometimes you can steal from that fourth. You know, a lot of times again, going back to the four three, when you had a Sam, a Mike, and a Will, you know, the guy that comes off the field when you go to nickel defense is the Sam linebacker. So that means you're playing with the Mike and the Will. So if you have your three backups to, to your Sam, Mike, and Will, and then if you can use that that starting Sam linebacker in a phase or two, so it's really three and a half linebackers, maybe four. Yep. Um, that's always good. We, we don't have that luxury now. We don't keep as many of those linebackers now because really we're really in sub defense probably 75 or 80 percent of the time. Yeah. So, so really we kind of lose a linebacker and they gain a you, you gain an edge rush types and. And, and so that's a, what I call a tweener. He's in between the linebacker and defensive end. Um, and sometimes those guys are suited to be really good uh, and, and really productive players. And sometimes it's just more difficult. So, again, the way we're the way we're set up now, if I can get two, if not at least two of those guys that back up linebackers to be contributors, and maybe a third. We're in good shape. Usually then you're looking at two safeties. You know, usually you keep four, if not five safeties on your on your uh, uh 46 man roster. Most of the time it's four. So if you can get the two backups to be contributors, and a lot of times you keep five corners. So if you can get uh, probably the fourth and fifth corners to be contributors, that's a big deal. So if you think a couple DB or uh, a couple corners, a couple safeties, that's four, uh, five, six linebackers, a tight end seven, uh, a receiver or two, eight, nine, and a, and a running back 10. So if you can get 10 guys to be really, really core contributors, you, you got something going. Let's uh, let's let's play a game of um, a guy you remember, big time contributor at the various positions we're talking about over the years that contributed to your special teams effort. You know, I might I might throw a name out there and then ask you for for others um, at the receiver position. A guy that comes to my mind real quickly, Tab Perry, because of the ninety four yard kickoff return touchdown against the Pittsburgh Steelers that I'll never forget. But mm -hmm. Tab Perry was. Pretty damn good special teams guy, wasn't he? What about Tab Perry? Yeah, he was fantastic because he played. He, he played like a safety. I mean, he was two hundred and he was over two hundred pounds. Um, you know, from a mentality standpoint, he played like a safety. Meaning, he was a starting gunner for us too. And if you have a receiver that's a starting gunner on the punt team, again, you, you got something going because those guys think differently. But he could go down, he could tackle, he wasn't afraid of contact. Which sometimes that's what receivers get labeled as as, as being, uh, you know, not the most physical guys. But he was. And the simple fact that he was also a, a a really good returner for us was another huge positive. So, you know, I, I can think of a lot of receivers we've had that have been really key contributors. You know, one of the first ones was, was probably, uh, you know, Kevin Walter. Sure. Well, Kevin Walter was a hell of a player for us, you know, and, and then he, he just kept developing his receiver. And ultimately, he ends up going to Houston and being a starting receiver in Houston for a long time. He kind of graduated up and yeah. and, and was a contributor there. Um uh, James Wright was another one that uh, we drafted in the seventh round who uh, people really don't know. And James is a receiver from LSU. And uh, uh, people really don't know that the, the two starting receivers at LSU at one time were James Wright and Odell Beckham. <laughs> okay? James Wright got hurt and missed a season. And that's what allowed Jarvis Landry to come on. But Jarvis Landry was kind of the, the, the third wheel. Huh. And James gets hurt and Jarvis Landry um, comes into the mix. And then, uh, James Wright kind of gets Wally pipped and then, yeah. uh, uh, you know, and obviously, you know, obviously Jarvis and, and Odell are, are fantastic players and have been in this league for a long time. So, I mean, that's a couple of good receivers right there that I can remember. Sure. What about uh, at the running back position? You already mentioned the guy that comes to mind, uh, you know, to me is, is uh, Cedric Pyramid. I mean, that, that guy was, was he about as good as you've had coach? Yeah, I think so. I mean, he, he was, he, he was a fantastic player. I, I, I think that, uh, he was he was somebody who really developed. I think really matured. Not that he was ever immature, but I think he really understood how it or what it took to prepare 
um, and, and he understood what his role was on our team. You know, and, and I think what, if you get these young guys, whether it be rookies or you know young players, to understand what it takes to not only play, but what your role is, where do you fit, and, and how do I stay in this thing? So a lot of times in this thing, it's survival, it's survival to fit. Who, who can, you know, stay with their, their head above water the longest? And I think Sed Pierman understood right away that he probably was, was not going to be a starting running back in this league, that he was going to be a backup. And, and to be a backup, the definition of being a backup running back in the NFL is you better be a great special teams player. And he was one of the best ones we ever had. And, and uh, he was one of the best players overall that we ever had here. Um, but he, he was a fantastic one. I, I think I said earlier, Rex Burkhead is another one who, who played really, really well for us. Whenever we lost Ted Pierman, Rex stepped right into that role. And uh, – um, he, he's somebody that uh, I, I have an immense amount of respect for too. We, we've been fortunate to have a couple of good players in that spot. Uh, from the at the linebacker position, I guess the first name that comes to mind for me is Vinny Ray, who is now the team chaplain. How about that? Yeah. Vinny Ray is the Bengals team chaplain now, but yeah. Vinny was uh, just such a great player and great human being as well. Obviously, well, when, when you when you look up the definition of what a pro is, you know, I think in the in the dictionary. And people don't understand what what it, what that really that term means to be a pro. They'd see Vinny Ray, and uh, Vinny Ray again was a was a guy who uh, you know came here as a college free agent at a Duke. Um, the the one thing that uh, people <laughs> probably don't know about Vinny is that Vinny could flat fly. Vinny could really run. He ran the low four fives um, coming out of Duke. Wow. Um, I, I remember uh, in a preseason game watching him run. And, and Vinny has these huge, long arms anyway. But what, seeing Vinny run and him being way out in front of everybody, I'm like, wow, this guy, we, we've got to find a place or find a way to, to get him and keep him around here. And I, I think it's the perfect example of Vinny being a self-made guy. He came here as a college free agent. He worked his tail off to get to be – he started off on our practice squad. He then became a core contributor for us on, on, on the, the, the 46-man roster as a player. And then again, he kept getting just kept getting better and better and better. And I, and I think that uh, um, if you looked up what mean a, a pro is to you, probably right next to Vinny, you'd see Dahani Jones. And I think yep. that Dahani was the guy that really mentored Vinny yep. and, and showed Vinny what it meant to be a, a pro player. I mean, how you study, how you prepare, doing everything that you, that you can do to be a great team player. And, and then, you know, as Dahani then moved on, Vinny then moves right into the starting role. And, uh, you know, I saw the complete evolution of Vinny from a, from being a college frager, from being a nobody to working his way up uh, to be a really good special teams player, to become a starting linebacker for us. And then kind of on the back end of him when he became a backup player again and a, and a core special teams player. So I saw the whole gamut of Vinny Ray. And, uh, um, again, you know, I'm super excited that Vinny is going to be our chaplain and, and be around and have him have the opportunity to – uh, not only spiritually, you know, show and teach a lot of our guys, but but also what it takes to be a pro, what it means to be a good teammate and, and a good player uh, in this thing. So I'm, I'm very excited that, that he's going to be around here and, and and get the opportunity to shed his knowledge. Yeah, you can't can never go wrong adding Vinny Ray to any organization. There's no question right. about it. what a sure. ass act in every, every sense of the word. Safety, I, I, I guess probably a guy that would come to mind is a guy currently, Brandon Wilson. I mean, Brandon Wilson mm – -hmm. Return guy can play other other spots for you. How about Brandon Wilson as a as a candidate? Well, I think Brandon Wilson is is a very unique guy. It's not very often you have a safety who's also a returner. You know, most of the time you're, you're from the safety position, you're getting the blocker, you're getting a, a good cover player. Um, but what people don't know that Brandon was a, a, a did a multitude of things at, at the University of Houston. Um, you know, the one thing that really jumped off the tape and jumped off the table uh, of us and really Braden Combs is a big part of, of this and, and, and fighting for Brandon way back when was Brandon could fly. Brandon could really run. And uh, Brandon played running back. He played corner and he played safety all, all during his time in Houston. So his background as a running back shows up as, as a, you know, as a returner. And so Brandon is very talented physically. He can really run. He's tough. Um, he, he has good running instinct. I think that showed up, you know, a lot of times. Um, and, and the plays that he's made um, as a returner. But uh, to be multifaceted like that and have a variety of uh, uh, tools in your tool belt to do a lot of things, I, I think makes you super, super, super valuable. And, uh, it, you know, he was the highest priority or one of the highest priorities we had to, to get him back this year. He was a free agent. And, and I was super, super excited once I got the call that, that he was going to be back with us because he's a huge part. Not only as a return player, but he's also a, a really good cover player for us, yep. too. 
Yeah. No, uh, but we've been fortunate to have some safeties that have been good players. We, you know, we Jeremy Miles was a a, a really good a cover player for us. Sure. Um, we had another kid, Kyrie Zabear, you know, at one time in, in the, um, the mid 2000s was a, was a good, really good cover player for us, too. And, we, we, you know, like I said, we, we've had the opportunity to be around a lot of good, uh, a lot of good guys that way we've developed. So let's fast forward to uh, to this edition, the 2021 edition of the Cincinnati Bengals. I, I know it's early, early stage mm -hmm. finished OTAs and uh, minicamp was was uh, truncated to, to a one day minicamp. But you've. Quite a few workouts you've seen seen guys uh, out there on the field, not pads yet, no helmets, mm -hmm. no shoulder pads and, and uh, that type of thing, just helmets, shorts, T-shirts. But maybe a few guys for fans to work their ears about and, and uh, sharpen their eyes toward watching that might contribute to special teams this year. Well, I, I think that uh, there's, there's several spots, I think, that are, are going to be hot spots for us. Obviously, you know, we, we've kind of hit on a couple of them earlier. You know, the, the punting position is going to be a hot spot for us. I think the kicking position is going to be a hot spot for us. Certainly the punt return position is going to be the real hot spot for us. Yeah. You know, there, there are several guys that are really vying for that spot. You know, I, I think Darius Phillips is a guy who has a, a, a ton of ability um, through a variety of reasons, has never gotten, a, 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 not gotten really going in that area from the punt return standpoint. Um you know, it started off a year ago, you know, I expected him to, to be right in the mix for that job. And then, you know, after the injury to Trey Waynes back in um, the early parts of training camp, Darius got thrust into the starting role on defense and, and right. he had a huge role there. So I kind of had to back him out of the return area. So I think Darius Phillips is going to, will, will be vying for that spot. You know, another young guy that, that uh, I think people should keep their eye on is this kid Puka Williams. Um, you know, we got to try to teach him to be what it takes to be a, a punt return, but he's, he's a, uh, he's an exciting player. He's an exciting player in college, um, uh, you know, and, and we'll, we'll see if he can learn to, to, to play that position and do the things that it takes to play that position. Um, but, but he certainly is exciting once he gets the ball in his hand. Um, you know, that, that's a couple new guys here. I'm kind of looking at my uh, uh, roster. You know, we, we really don't have any new linebackers that, that uh, um, show right. up that way yet. Um, again, it's been very limited. It's difficult. I, I think this, it, it was better than it was last off season. You know, we had no OTAs last year. We had, we had no hands on, um, uh, you know, these guys a year ago and it was limited this year. There really wasn't a lot of competitive stuff that went on in the off season. So I, I, I think it's going to be a better time for a lot of those competitions to really crank up in training camp. Um, you know, but, but there's some guys that, uh, you know, even still I expect that, that were, are, are really second year players for us that I expect to make big jumps this year that the pot kind of fly under the radar a little bit, probably for most people. One of those guys is a Akeem Davis Gaither, you know, mm -hmm. who, who I thought super highly of coming out of uh, the senior bowl a year ago. And he's probably not a, uh, uh, you know, a really, really high, well-known guy. Uh, but I hope he is after this season. Um, he has that type of ability. He plays linebacker for us. He, he's going to be in a lot of key critical roles for us. I expect him to make a big jump. As I do Marcus Bailey, I think Marcus Bailey is another linebacker that uh, is going to be right in line. It, it, you know, it's it very unique for Marcus. Marcus came off an ACL. He tore his ACL late in his or uh, during his senior season, so he missed part of his senior season and uh, was really never a hundred percent for us, uh, but played. Um, but but I've really noticed a, a big difference in him in, in his movements. How much better? How much quicker? How much healthier he looks right now than he did. Um, even at the end of last season, I mean, he, he really looks good. So I, I think we're going to, I think you're going to see a, a big, big uh, uh, jump out of him. So, you know, and again, we've got to find something from the running back position. Uh, you know, somebody has got to really come to the forefront, whether it's Chris Evans, you know, one of our draft picks or Travion Williams, you know, I, I have a, a, you know, Samaje is a, a P Ryan and we're glad to get him back. Um, but he's going to probably bump up to the number two running back spot. So, I got to try to watch what his role becomes, but Travion and Chris Evans, somebody's got to come out of that spot. Certainly the one that we, we've got to get something out of is these backup tight ends, you know, whether it be Mason Shrek or Mitch Wilcox, they got big shoes to fill and trying to replace Ethan Carter. And uh, I mean, th those are really big shoes to fill. So there'll be a couple spots. It's going to be unique too. I think to see what we get out of the backup corner, you know, I kind of already mentioned Darius a little bit, but some of these other backup corners got to come in and fill roles as, as do the, really the backup safety. Who's going to be the third safety. You know, we've, We've been, you know, as fortunate to have a guy in Sean Williams who I kind of 
saw his evolution go from being a backup to then becoming a starting player, then kind of coming back with me again. Um, so it was yep. very unique to uh, see that and, 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 and how he, uh, you know, I have an immense amount of respect for, for him. You know, sometimes I think when guys go from being starting players, now they got to go back and play special teams. They, that, that's not always, they're not always accepting of that. Right. But it turns, but he was, and I think it shows what a great team player he was and, and he's somebody that, that uh, I will miss. But, but I understand that that's part of the game. Sometimes guys move on, and, and I understand that part. And, and now we'll, we'll see how, you know, that, that spot's open. You know, we have guys that R- Ricardo Allen will be one guy to play that spot. And, and uh, Kayvon Frazier and Trayvon Henderson, we'll, we'll see how they all come, all come in and compete for that. Coach, you know, it's uh, special teams. It's football now. And it's, it's, it, there's offense, defense, special teams. So turnovers. Winning the turnover battle is a big deal. Winning the turnover margin on a on a game by game basis is big. If uh, and usually that's not a significant number, uh, but but it's a factor. But you, you're you're always very intent on winning the average drive start. If the mm-hmm. Bengals start every position possession at the 32 yard line and the opponent is starting theirs at the 27, that's five mm-hmm. yard average drive start differential. Multiply it by 10 possessions which is, you know, typical in an NFL game anyway, that's half a football field right there of hidden yards, right? Field position. Is that the biggest thing to you uh, on a, on a game by game basis? It's really the only stat that matters to me. It, re- it really doesn't matter to me what our returner averages, what our punter averages, what our punt returner averages. Um, re- that really doesn't matter to me. It, it's, it's really the most important part is, is how often, uh, you know, where does our offense get the ball at after a special teams play versus where do our defense, where does our defense get the ball at after special teams play? And there's a lot that come, goes into that, whether it's, you know, our, our, our punter and our punt return team executing a plus 50 punt and be able to down a ball, let's say inside the five yard line, or it could be on the flip side of that, our return team, how good of a job do we do blocking? And, you know, maybe a ball hits at the five yard line that they're punting to us and that ball skips into the end zone. And, uh, uh, and just little plays like that that don't seem like a big deal at the time are huge deals. You know, I, I'm sure Joe Burrow would a hell of a lot rather, you know, whenever he walks onto the field, you know, huddle at the uh, uh, 10 yard line versus huddle up standing in, in his own end zone. That, that, that's a big deal. Um, right. And, and kind of the same thing for our defense. You know, um, I, I want our defense pushed back towards that end zone back there and, and, you know, put the pressure on their offense to, you know, force them into making mistakes because they, they feel the pressure of where they're at on the field and, and, and trying to get that exchange. So that is the single most important job that we have is trying to control field position, um, vertical field position. And, uh, you know, the efficiency we do that is, is how we'll ultimately be judged. Well, you've done it unbelievably well for coming up on 20 years now. Here's the 20th uh, anniversary as such of Darren Simmons with the Cincinnati Bengals. And what a two decade run it's been for, for that phase of it special teams phase consistently one of the best in the national football league as a unit. And in my estimation, best special teams coach in the league bar none and deservedly assistant head coach soon to be head coach in the NFL at some point in time here, probably sooner rather than later. And coach Simmons, thanks for carving time for us. And it was a, a great football education in, uh, in special teams play and can't thank you enough. Well, I, as, as always, Dave, I appreciate your support too. It's especially coming from a former player like that. That uh, all the work that you put in, and, and, and you knowing the game of football and understanding the game of football, I think helps. You know, in, in the way that you can relate that information that to our fans and to the people makes it uh, um, very beneficial and very useful. So I, I really appreciate um, being on here, and, and I've always appreciated your support. And and uh, you know, hopefully we can get this thing going and get us back to where we, we need to be in, in the winning column again, get our fans excited, get everybody excited again. I hear that, Coach. I'm with you 100,000%. Hi, Dave Lapham here. Have you heard about In the Trenches with Dave Lapham presented by First Star Logistics? Catch new episodes from the world of sports and broadcasting. Search for In the Trenches with Dave Lapham on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts.